Okay, so then uh, let me see the screen share seems to work. Um, okay, so then welcome uh, everybody to the tutorial at the East Week um, on privacy. Um, so the, uh, the the title of the talk or the title of the tutorial is "You Better Act Normal um, or Solution Attempts to a Ubiquitous Observation." Um, uh, let me say in advance that um, that I'm not the typical East Week um, researcher, but um, <clears throat> we're usually um, well, we're working on, uh, we've been working on networks in the past, but uh, we're mainly working on, on privacy in, in different types of data. Um, right now, <clears throat> we have um, two large projects. One is CETI, and CETI is the Center for Tactile Internet with Human in the Loop in Dresden, at the University of Dresden, um, where we are um, thinking about how skills can be um, uh, transmitted using technology. So how can we, instead of just um, provide access to, to information, like through Wikipedia or something, but um, the question there is, how can how can we actually provide access to skills like uh, how can i can, how can i learn to surf or how can i learn to play certain sports and so on over the internet essentially and um, naturally um, if we are providing such kind of um, functionality um, that um, requires that um, we have very close observation of the human behavior like uh, we're working a lot with smart suits as you'll see, as you'll see a little bit later um, where we have sensors all over the body that that will actually tell the computer how somebody's moving, or we have um, uh, motion capturing systems um, that uh, tell uh, people uh, that, that uh, record how people are moving. Um, and um, but of course, this is not um, not only uh, the situation or such kind of um, observation. Close observation is not only the situation when you're in such kind of um, functionality in such kind of worlds. But even if you think about um, the current um, situation where, where everybody is carrying out a smartphone with lots of sensors, um, then you can already, from the smartphone or on the smartphone, you can already record gait, so the way that people are walking, for example. Um, or when you think about um, LIDARs um, that are um, installed in, in cars, um, then you can uh, recognize how people are, how, again, how people are walking that are passing by. If you think about 5G or 6G, um, uh, the fifth or sixth generation of mobile communications, um, then, um, then people are talking about um, uh, sensing at, at the same time as, as, uh, as communicating. So essentially using the, the antennas um, that, you, that you have at hand um, for sensing the, the environment at the same time. But then suddenly, even if you're walking through a, through a city, um, then suddenly there's going to be somebody looking at you the whole time. I mean, this is not something that um, that where, where, where there's a person looking at you um, as an individual. But of course, in, in, um, in, if, if you uh, look at it from a, an abstract perspective, you are under ubiquitous observation. So you will not be able to be anywhere without um, certain cameras or certain sensors tracking you and, and, and looking at you. And um, this whole... Um, situation in the, in the context of the excellence cluster, we've been thinking about so, this whole situation. And uh, we started um, thinking about uh, means or ways um, of anonymizing that data, because of course, a lot of the functionality that, um, that we want to implement does not require identifying the people or, or even worse, uh, learning certain um, private information about the people. Um, the only thing that, um, that usually is required is utility. So, um, and, and, the sense of um, the function that we want to implement is something like counting how many people there are, for example, or, um, or, or um, we have a smart city project in, um, <clears throat> together with the city of Antibes and um, uh, Darmstadt, but Hersfeld but Hersfeld and so on. <clears throat> and they're sometimes interesting, interested to see how dense the people are. So if, um, for example, during the pandemic, um, the, uh, the idea was that um, people should, uh, should uh, there should be social, dis uh, social distancing and um, and uh, so the cities wanted to know if people actually adhere to the social distancing. So just figuring out if there were people that were closer together um, than they were supposed to be, um, without um, any, uh, any interest in the identity of the of the citizens in that case, um, just in order to figure out what the situations are. Um, so here we have a, a difference between what we want to achieve, namely, for example, counting the number of people in a certain place or um, figuring out how dense the population, uh, the, the people in a certain area are um, versus certain privacy risks, namely um, being able to identify the individual individuals or um, even learning certain information about the individuals. When you think about 
um, collecting gate data, for example. That's one of our big tasks that we're doing at the moment. So um, recording how people are walking, this gives away a lot of information about, uh, about the people. So it, um, you, you can uh, infer if the person is old or young, if it's a man or, or a woman. <clears throat> you can infer if, um, if they are sportive um, or not. Um, you can infer the age. Um, you can see the body posture, of course, just by simple things. You can infer many um, secondary information that, again, for the functionality are, are entirely useless or unwanted, um, but in some sense, they provide a privacy risk and, um, and we're thinking about how we can deal with that risk. Okay, um, <clears throat> so this just as a starter, by the way, um, we have roughly two, two hours. Um, and um, now since we are a comparatively small consortium, I would suggest that if you have questions, just um, just uh, go right, uh, right away and, and ask. Um, I, can I think I can see the chat. You can also send chat messages. Um, but you can also just unmute yourself and, and say and, and say something or, or ask something, um, because uh, um, I think here we don't really run risk that um, that uh, uh, that there will be too much chaos um, if, if we have a um, flexible discussion. Um, excellent. So um, let's go. Uh, where do I have to click? Uh, I should be able to click here. Yes, here we go. So um, just a very, very brief schedule. Um, I would probably um, give you a very brief introduction to privacy in general. Um, then I would also check because here I don't see the right things that I wanted to see. Um, okay, there we go. Um, <clears throat> then um, I would uh, give you a, a very brief overview of um, uh, privacy threat modeling. Um, you know that in security, Security never makes sense um, if, you, if there are no threats. Um, so we have to figure out what the threats are first to then be able to, to um, deal with the threats. And this, of course, by applying some kind of security and privacy is in some sense also a subdomain of security. Um, then um, we will probably have a short coffee break. So I, I was uh, thinking that after 45 minutes, it's gonna be difficult for you to, um, to look at my video. Um, and, uh, and hence maybe it may, it may make sense that um, everybody can run and get a coffee. Um, then we can also like discuss for maybe two or three minutes um, if there's questions and then maybe at nine, five past nine I would go through a couple of case studies. Um, the case studies will only um, show that um, when we think that anonymization, uh, so achieving privacy seems to be simple, um, then I have uh, four case studies that will show that what industry is commonly saying um, they are doing to anonymize the data is actually ineffective. And then we probably have a little bit of time for a Q&A. Okay, questions so far? If that's not the case, um, let me, let's get going. Okay, <clears throat> so I was already mentioning that, um, that security only makes sense if we think about threats. And when you think about classical IT security, then we, have, we commonly have two types of threats. So the first threat is data loss. Um, you see the picture here of Karl uh, Spitzweg. Um, the picture, picture is uh, called intercepted love letter. I don't know if you can see it through Zoom. But essentially, you have a, a young man here um, who is uh, trying to um, uh, convey a love letter to his mistress. Unfortunately, there's also um, the mother or the lady of the mistress, and, uh, and she can intercept the love letter. And hence, um, there's data that is accessible to unintended parties, um, and the young boy is getting into trouble. Um, so one of the common threats that we think about in, in security data loss. And you know that we have the Enigma um, or other types, types of systems, um, encryption systems, um, that will provide um, solutions for data loss. And the second common threat that we're talking about um, is uh, manipulation and forgery. I don't know if you know the story of Maria Stewart, the Queen of Scots. Um, but um, this is the picture here shows Maria Stewart. She was the, the Queen of Scotland. Scotland. And um, apparently she was conspiring um, to overthrow the English queen. And um, in order to figure out um, or in order to give, get proof, um, there was a plot um, where somebody was um, sending her a letter <clears throat> in the name of one of her co-conspirators asking her for the names of other co-conspirators. Um, so essentially impersonating one of her um, co-conspirators. And she fell for the plot um, and, uh, and acknowledged that some of the names were co-conspirators. Uh, co um, and hence, um, that was uh, used as evidence to then actually bring her to court and uh, court martial her. And uh, so in this case, the second threat that we um, commonly talk about, again, is manipulation forgery, um, that where we say that there's tempered or spoofed data and um, the victims fall for tempering and spoofing. 
Now, um, usually we have two different um, uh, security objectives that deal with these two threats. And the first of call, course, when we talk about data loss is confidentiality, we apply encryption. Um, and the second of, of course is integrity. Um, we apply, for example, message authentication codes um, or other integrity measures in order to make sure that manipulation doesn't happen or well, manipulation can happen, but um, that it's detected. Now, when we, when we talk about this classical security view, we also have a specific model in mind. And uh, the model is usually that we say, okay, we have Alice and Bob, you know, Alice and Bob, A and B. Um, Alice and Bob are usually the partners of the communication and, um, and Alice and Bob both reside in trusted domains. So we assume that, um, that they can actually trust their own computers. Um, otherwise we can, could not apply crypto, uh, cryptographic algorithms. Um, and, um, and then what happens is that we say, okay, Alice wants to send a message to Bob and the message is either um, confidential or should not be tampered with. Um, and uh, in the classical security view, what happens is that then we have an eavesdropper, like a passive adversary um, that we usually call Eve, or we have an um, active adversary that we usually call Mallory or a malicious adversary, um, where the passive adversary is not interfering with the communication, but of course they will be active in the sense that they will try to break the crypto. Um, but Mallory as a malicious or active adversary can even interfere with the communication and try to um, uh, disturb the protocol that Alice and Bob are actually running. And then um, the classical security goals and adversaries that we have, we say we have the goals of confidentiality, integrity, and usually we also talk about availability of, as the third um, security goal, um, because it would be really easy to achieve confidentiality and integrity if we would, not, um, if we would simply not communicate. Um, but that would be a little bit um, boring. Um, so hence um, we say, well, when, when Alice and Bob want to communicate, so if there is the, a legitimate entity that um, wants to use a service, they should be able to do so. Okay, and again, well, you just saw that in the last message. Sometimes we also talk about different types of adversaries than only even Mallory, um, but that's a general situation here. Um, maybe just to, um, to sort this, um, uh, this is the, the really classical security review where we, where we will talk about crypto and where, um, cryptographers will, will um, come to the rescue. Um, sometimes we also talk about other um, situations. So sometimes in the case of network security, we talk about adversaries that will, uh, that will explode this model, the simplified model of the, of the channel to the network and that will then try to um, attack the network. Um, so then we will, will have to de deal with network security. Sometimes we also say that Bob or Alice do not really have trusted domains, be the domains because we may have somebody attacking the trust, um, the trusted domain. So then we talk about system or software security. So just to give you a very high level overview. Um, and of course, um, now since today we talk about privacy, I will say that um, security is something that we clearly have under control. Um, so uh, we've been working on this for hundreds of years. Well, for, well, actually, if you think about crypto, we've been working on this for thousands of years. And, um, and so this should be a solved problem. Of course, it's not right. So you can see um, that, uh, well, whenever you, uh, you look into the news, um, you see that um, there are plenty of problems um, that arise also in the context of um, system security um, that, that are potentially not really quite solved. However, today we don't want to talk about security as such, but we want to talk about privacy. And I, I would like to convince you that privacy belongs to this domain, but it's um, some, something slightly different. Um, okay, so um, so what is privacy now? Um, I don't know if some of you have read uh, 1984 by George Orwell, um, but it's a it's a book that has been written in 1948, and um, and there's one very interesting quote where where George Orwell wrote, um, "With the development of television and the technical advance which made it possible to receive and transmit simultaneously on the same instrument, private life life came to an end." Um, so if you think again about our smartphones today. Um, in 1948, George Orwell didn't think that we would have that, um, but he was in his in his uh, novel. Um, he uh, he uh, uh, foresaw that um, once um, there can be an entity that can observe what you're doing at the same time as you're doing it, there is no private life anymore. And to some extent, I guess this is um, this is um, demonstrated today, um, and we'll have a look um, why that may, may be the case. Let's try to define privacy first. So if you look into the DEC dictionary, um, then, uh, uh, well, privacy, um, as we will um, usually use the, the term, is sometimes also called uh, privacy. Um, so the British English, um, or the British will usually um, pronounce it as privacy. I will use privacy because I got used to that. 
And if you think about the definition of, of uh, privacy, then um, the, the dictionary says the quality or state of being apart from company or observation or seclusion. Um, or be freedom from unauthorized intrusion, one right, uh, one's right to privacy. So essentially the idea is that you can with, uh, withdraw yourself from somebody else um, looking at you or observing what you're doing and so on. I'm, I'm not having so much time, so I'm going to skip this, but I will share the slides later um, so you can have a look at the discussions. Um, <clears throat> from a legal perspective, this is a comparatively, comparatively young um, uh, domain or a comparatively young concept. Uh, the first time that privacy was um, was discussed in uh, in legal in a legal in the legal context was in 1890, so um, only like 130 years ago. Um, in the context of the Harvard Law Review, um, where um, Samuel Warren and Louis Brandeis um, realized that um, in that at that moment um, journalists were starting to have snapshot photography, so they could start to take pictures. Um, at any point in time of anybody. And then they realized that um, this allowed newspapers to publish photographs of individuals without obtaining their consent. So they could simply run around taking a picture and, uh, and opening the door to the toilet or whatever, taking a picture and putting some news in, in the newspaper. And then they were saying, okay, so this is, um, uh, this is some, something new. This is not really like a, a, an objective kind of a, of a damage because there's, you're not taking away any values um, as such, no money, no, no um, objectives, no objects. <clears throat> but they were still, still saying that um, private individuals were being con continually injured um, because essentially they would not be able to defend their honor. Um, and um, so hence they were saying, so, um, so we, we realized that this is something conceptually new, we have to do something new here. And then they were um, starting to argue that um, privacy, sh there should be a, a right to privacy. So there should be the right that you get, un uh, that, it, uh, that you can control what people are doing with information about you. And, um, and in conclusion, they were saying, so there should also be not only a right to, to retain your assets, but also there should be a right to be let alone if you wish. And this idea is, um, is the, the basic fundamental behind the legal concepts of privacy, let's say. Um, so now, now I've been uh, talking about security and privacy a little bit in general. So if then we, we think about the differences, um, then uh, maybe a slightly um, more frequent, uh, uh, a slightly more recent um, quote that I would use is the quote of Alan Weston, because this really very much reflects um, our current idea what privacy is. Um, and Alan Weston in 1967, in the context um, of, of a large affair in the United States, um, was uh, saying, okay, so privacy, privacy should be the claim of individuals to determine for themselves when, how, and what uh, extent of information about them is communicated to others. Um, so again, the concept that um, somebody may get information about you, uh, but you should be in control um, what happens to this information, no matter who the other person is, um, be it um, another individual on the street, um, be it a journalist, or be it the state, be it whoever. Um, you should be um, under control of which information about you is, um, is communicated or used or processed. So then if we think about um, what we were just talking, uh, or what I was just saying, then we realize that IT security is really concerned with protecting data and services. So we were saying there should be confidentiality of data, there should be integrity of data, there should be availability of services. So the context, uh, the focus of IT security is really of uh, protecting the data itself or the services. Now, if we think about privacy, um, privacy really is concerned with protecting humans from data or humans from processing of data. So what we think about in privacy when we talk about privacy is um, that we, uh, we want to make sure that um, uh, collection, um, capturing collection and processing of data about a certain individual should not um, provide any harm to this individual. So we don't, of, of course, and if, if we want to achieve privacy, we will have to make, uh, we, will, we will have to use the mechanisms that we also use in IT security. But the goal is slightly different. We don't think so much about the, uh, the security of the data or the confidentiality of the data. We think about um, essentially the humans um, about, who, about, about whom this data is collected. Now, um, you may have realized that in the, in the last 10 years, maybe many more people are talking about privacy as compared to before. And, um, and I think uh, that this has a very simple um, reason. So if we think about humanity um, and, and society in general, and, um, and we think how we have um, developed over the last 40,000 years, let's say, let's, uh, let's talk about homo sapiens, um, then there are a couple of, hum uh, of cultural practices 
that we as humans have evolved and um, that we as humans have learned how to deal with. So for example, we know how to keep diaries, for example, or, or how to make notes and keep notes. We know how to exchange information, for example, sending letters, and we know that when we're sending a postcard, it's, it's not, there's no confidentiality um, or no expectation of privacy. We know how to get information. So for example, if we want to um, get a newspaper, we can go to the, to the newspaper stand and we can buy the newspaper um, and uh, we can pay cash. So um, we know how that works. We can um, verify, we can prove who we are when we cross borders, for example. We, we know how to collect and share memories, um, for example, having uh, photo albums that we usually um, keep somewhere, maybe in our basement or in, in our living room, somewhere in a closet. And we also know certain other things um, that have worked quite well in the um, analog domain. And then if we think about um, three properties of, of these cultural practices, namely type, scope, and trust, then we realized that um, the access type was entirely decentralized and personal. So um, when you go to the newspaper stand, you don't have to show your identity card. You just you, you just buy the newspaper, um, and that, that's uh, that's it. And uh, it's also entirely um, uh, decentralized um, because uh, there's no central entity that knows who's buying which newspapers where. Of course. And if you think about the scope, then the, the scope is purely local. So um, uh, when you make a, a photo album and you keep it in your in your living room. Um, again, it's it's a local thing, and somebody would have to get to your living room in order to get access to your to your photo album, of course. And then, we, when we think about the third um, property, which is the trust, um, we realized that um, we only needed to, we learned that we have to have, have trust in direct peers. So, if I if I look at the scenario here, I need to trust my newspaper um, boy, for example, because they will learn what information I'm uh, I'm interested in. Or if I'm showing my photo album, well, I'm showing it to the person that's with me in the room. Um, or maybe let's say that we grew up in villages or in clans, um, then, uh, then essentially we knew who, whom we had to trust um, in this context. And this is, these are our properties that we as a society have learned over thousands of years, and where also we have um, established certain habits and, and certain, certain cultural ways of dealing with situations. For example, nobody was going to take a photo of somebody who was walking home drunk Friday night from a bar. Um, because that was just like unwanted, and um, and even if somebody was taking a photo, um, where that photo would ed end up in a in a photo album somewhere somewhere locally stored um, in the basement or in the living room of, of the person who was taking the photo. Okay, now look look let's look back at the situation. Um, we said that we have a, a couple of cultural practices that we learned how to how to deal with them, and now of course we do all of, the, all of this in a digital way, right? So um, we know how to keep diaries, we know how to send emails. We have um, smart TVs where, where we can access movies or Netflix, whatever. Um, we can authenticate um, uh, online where we can keep uh, memories in the case that, uh, or in the sense that uh, suddenly you have Facebook and so on, where you can upload all your photos and you can share your photos. Hi, Akash. Um, and uh, of course, there are other kinds of, um, of uh, services that we can use um, that, um, that are much more easy to use um, or much that, that gain a lot of power by making them digital, of course. Also, there are additional more uh, modern kinds of services. Uh, I'm sorry that the video is probably a bit choppy, um, but when you think about um, the new uh, devices that we're developing, um, then of course, um, with the new devices, we get a lot of opportunities to improve the services or, or develop new, uh, newer services um, that were not even thinkable um, in the old way or in the old world. And um, again, I will share the, the slides so then you can have a look at them. Um, but there are many things that we can do today um, that were not possible before. However, if we think back about um, the situation that I was talking about before, so um, the cultural practices in the past, access type, scope, um, and trust, um, local, decentralized, and, um, and trust into the, into the peers that are, were sharing the room or the, the village with you. Now, suddenly the situation has changed drastically because suddenly, of course, we have the internet. And um, through the internet, you can, wherever you are, you can uh, connect to these services. And of course, there are plenty of services. You can connect to them with different devices, which also means that anybody else, of course, around the world can connect to these um, services, um, no matter where they are. Um, so suddenly, your living room is the world. Um, and of course, these services, um, they're also not only providing a single service, so the service providers um, provide plethora of services, which again is, is um, from the perspective of functionality is really nice because they can provide much better services. 
um, from the perspective of, uh, of us as a society, it um, provides us with a couple of questions because um, suddenly, again, if we think about type, scope, and trust, where suddenly with regards to access type, we have central unique global login um, services. So you actually have to identify yourself to, to, to be able to upload a photo to, into your own photo album. Um, for example, we have global access over the internet, so you can access it from anywhere, but also anybody else can access it, can access your data from anywhere. And maybe the, <clears throat> the worst um, situation is suddenly we, when we think about trust, well, we don't really know who to trust anymore, right? So before we had to trust the other entity that was with us in the room, but we don't have a room anymore, or well, the, the room is um, the entire world, essentially. So do we trust, I don't know, the service provider? I'm not sure. Do we trust the internet service provider? I'm not sure. Do we trust others? So, so suddenly we have lost control of who we have to trust with regards um, to the data and um, to the information that is processed and collected and processed about us. I'm, I'm going to skip this because I'm, I'm already um, uh, talking a lot. Um, and now, of course, the question is what could possibly go wrong? So, I mean, uh, so we have these services, we like these services, and why should we now suddenly think about privacy? Um, well, I mean, uh, sometimes we see headlines in the news which make it obvious. So, for example, there was this um, pregnancy app that was sharing your internet, intimate data with your boss. Um, so, you could download a pregnancy app. Um, that you could use for free well you can there are many of these apps that you can use for free in any case but there was one that you could also use for free um, because um, the uh, the app was sharing your pregnancy your inter your your um, cyclic uh, your, your menstrual cycle information with your boss also if you were um, in danger of um, of uh, becoming pregnant i as a professor who has a couple of phd students i very much enjoy that i tried to convince my phd students to um, install that app because that would of course give me a lot of information when they can write papers much better. Uh, for some reasons, they didn't really want to um, install that after all. Of course, um, we also see headlines with regard to Facebook. Uh, Facebook could pay billions after losing facial recognition, privacy appeal. But I mean, if you think about um, Facebook, uh, bashing Facebook um, has, has come out of, uh, uh, it's, it's, not, it's not really something that is, that is um, very novel or new. You, you know that um, the sentence that Mark Zuckerberg knows best is um, to say that I'm sorry. Um, and um, and uh, we know the overall situation there. But if we think about um, the entity that should be actually able to make sure that they that um, that they can keep their data private, who would be the entity? Well, when you consider who should be able to really keep their data secure and private, that should be the U.S. Army, right? Because I mean, this is the most powerful country in the world, and the army is the most powerful army in the world. You would think that they know how to keep their data private. Um, turns out um, they didn't. Um, so they lost information about secret army bases um, uh, because their soldiers um, were running, were doing the fitness runs, um, and um, and shared this information on Strava, uh, an app that you can use for running and sharing your runs. So this was more than two years old. Um, so this was a while ago. Everybody knows about that. You could uh, think that um, that uh, now the U.S. Army and whoever should be able to to uh, deal with that situation. Well, it turns out that um, not so long ago, this year in June, Strava uh, again uh, revealed runs of Israeli officials um, at secret army bases. Um, and, and by the way, so then you can say, okay, so I mean, maybe that's just like a, a, a sim singular incident. Ah, it turns out <laughs> um, the uh, not so long ago, also this year in April, um, there were brokers, data brokers selling um, data about US military personnel um, where data was essentially who they were, what their habits are, and where they are. Um, so uh, where they are on a real-time basis, um, as a matter of fact. Um, so you could uh, know their location um, at pretty much any time. OK, so you would say maybe that's a single incident. Uh, turns out um, there was another incident also this year. American phone tracking firm demoed surveillance powers by spying on CIA and NSA. So turns out that your mobile phone, if you, if you, turn, if you keep your location services turned on, um, uh, frequently and regularly um, shares your location with others. <clears throat> and um, this is a, an article that is really quite nice. It's a very short article but that I will invite you to have a look at um, because it shows quite nicely how people are using mobile devices and then um, due to their daily habits, it's really easy to figure out who they are. For example, if they go to certain addresses in Langley um, on a regular basis, well, you know, they work for the CIA. And, um, and then if their phones still share live location data, and, um, and this live location data is sold, then you can buy it. And then, of course, you can also know in a real time, uh, on a real time basis, where CIA um, uh, spies or agents are at any point in time. 
Um, so uh, this is probably a situation where I would say, hmm, so if even these guys don't manage um, to keep their data private, then, then maybe there is a problem um, that we have to think about. Now, <clears throat> the, the lecture could be really, um, really short um, because, of course, I could say, well, it's so simple. I mean, uh, we could simply go back uh, to the old days. Um, just let's get rid of all of our phones and let's get um, rid of all of our um, modern functionality and devices. But that, of course, is not really what's going to cut it. I mean, I, I'm also I I like to use this functionality and um, these devices, um, so um, we have to deal with the situation, of course. Okay, so um, essentially, um, when we think about the situation, um, now I'm I'm talking to you guys as developers or or, or researchers. Um, there's something that we can do um, before we uh, implement certain services or before we de develop certain apps. Um, that um, that will tell us um, to which extent we should take care of the situation. And um, in German or in European uh, legal um, terms, this is called a privacy assessment. Or um, um, <laughs> now I'm lacking the English word. A data privacy impact assessment. Um, here we go. And by the way, if you have uh, services in, in Europe, you you're required to do this. And, um, and if you want to do this, um, the first question that you can ask yourself is which data is actually captured. Um, so in, in many cases, there will be data that is collected and processed that does not relate to any individuals, and then you have to you don't have to bother about that. Um, but sometimes data relates to individual, and uh, and then if it does, you can still. The second question is, is going to be: um, Does it does this data processing affect individuals? So is it going to uh, reveal certain information about the individu individuals that come with a certain risk? Or other, otherwise, maybe what does it imply? So there can be sometimes there can be indirect conclusions that we can derive from data. Location, for example, as I was, was mentioning in the slide before, um, location at a, at a certain point, point in time may not immediately be um, uh, seeming seemingly a problem, or may not seem as a, an immediate problem. But when you can collect locations over a time, um, then of course you learn where people work, what they are doing, where they live, to which doctors they go, and so on. Um, so hence, if you, for example, um, collect and process um, location data, um, then you have to, then there's a, a direct privacy threat and then, um, and then you have to deal with the privacy threat. <clears throat> then um, the second question that you can ask yourself is what functionality is implemented or what, pi, uh, what type of processing beyond the collection is actually, um, is, is actually possible. And, and very often you will see that um, when you're implementing a certain service, you're collecting data that is not even required for the service. Um, so, for example, I was mentioning the, the um, uh, menstrual cycle tracker before. In order to collect data about the menstrual cycle, th th this is a very, very limited amount of information that you need. Um, and you don't need any, anything else. You don't need to use the camera. You don't need to use lo the location of the people. You, you probably don't even um, need to use Wi-Fi or Bluetooth or whatever. Um, so the data that you're collecting, you can, you can really limit it to what you need for the specific function. Um, and um, in, a, in a secondary point um, here, the, the second question would be, is the purpose clear? Um, so um, um, does the user know why you're collecting the data and which data you have to collect for, the, uh, for that purpose? And uh, we don't go to, into legalese here, but then you should also figure out if, um, if you have a legal basis for processing, but uh, we don't make this a legal lecture. Um, and, um, and then if you have uh, figured this out, then, then look at your, um, at your sketches for your, um, uh, for your development for your app again, and then think about, is there any other type of pro processing that is implemented or possible that goes beyond what we just uh, talked about? And if, it's, if this is the case, then just cut it. Then just um, don't, don't uh, collect more information that you need um, or don't provide more processing that, um, than you need um, to do, as, as, um, especially or specifically for this functionality, um, and you'll be fine. And then third question, who are the stakeholders? Um, so um, if you're thinking about the situation, I was mentioning before that it's a little bit difficult to figure out who we have to trust or what, um, what kind of trust we actually need to have. But it makes um, a lot of sense to think about um, the situation even for, for a simple mobile app. So for example, who, who are the individuals to whom the data relate, relates or can be affected? Um, so we've been investigating, for example, the Corona proximity tracing, the Corona warn applications um, that you may have heard of, about. And, um, and even if, if you think about such a simple functionality, this question is not so simple to answer. Um, well, afterwards, of course, it's obvious, but uh, when you're thinking about it, we would say, well, I mean, it's just the guy who's owning the phone. 
Um, but of course, that's not the case, right? Because the phone is collecting information about others as well. So there are other individuals to whom the data relates. Think about IoT devices. Um, very often you will say, well, maybe uh, um, Google, uh, Google Home uh, or, or um, Alexa, for example, if you have an Amazon Echo, you would say, well, I bought the Amazon Echo, then the data relates to me. But no, this is not the case because maybe you get visitors, you have children, uh, uh, children or kids running around your apartment, where suddenly there's other individuals to whom the data relates. Um, <clears throat> then the next question can be, which entity has de facto control or can access the data? Thinking about the Corona Warnip again, um, so this would, you, you would immediately think, so this information um, goes directly to the health authorities, um, which may be the case, but usually also the app developers in, in, uh, as intermediaries can get access to the data. Google and Apple, of course, get access to all of this data. We don't know if they get, if they, if they um, uh, actually do access the data, but for them it would be easy to get access to this data. So we have to keep in mind that these are also stakeholders which, which could, could get access, for example. Then who is processing the data? Um, that, that's usually um, slightly easier, at least as, as long as you don't share um, data with third parties. As, you, as soon as you um, build a mobile app, for example, and you use uh, libraries, and um, you don't um, make sure that the libraries do not contain any kind of um, trackers or any kind of data broker um, um, functionality, then you know the data is processed hopefully only by you and Google and Apple because they control the, uh, the mobile devices. Um, of course, then as soon as you share the data with others, um, because for example, you integrate um, advertisement um, libraries or something else, where some, so suddenly you don't even know who's processing the data because of the, the data that seemingly you're collecting for seemingly, seemingly, seemingly your functionality is also given to other, others. Okay, so that's just as a very big overview um, of what we have to think about. Now, let's go a little bit into details. Whoops, here we go. So first of all, um, thinking about um, how, we can, how we can identify individuals, um, what is data, uh, data, what are disclosure threats, and maybe how can we achieve anonymity. Um, so starting um, very easily, we can say that there are two types of data. So there can be a lot of data without any relation to individuals. And of course, there's also data with relation to individuals. Um, when you think about this first group here, you don't have to bother about privacy um, because uh, if there's no relation to individuals, uh, well, maybe you want to take care of confidentiality, but, um, but you don't need to bother about any individuals being involved. And there's a lot of data that we're processing on a regular basis. So when people say, oh, the, the new laws are hampering all of my functionality, that's bullshit, because most of the stuff that we're doing, we can still do because they're not related to any individuals. So whether data, planetary constellation, zodiac sign, simulation data, measurements from experiments, all this has no relation to individuals, fine, you can still, control, uh, you can still process it. Then, of course, there is data with relation to individuals. And here we have two types of data. So first of all, there's content. So I may be writing a message. And, and then the content of the message, of course, is one type of data. Or I can probably post a photo. Then the, the image itself is the content. And then there's also metadata. Um, so for example, when did I take the picture? Where did I take the picture? With whom do I share it? And so on. And we'll see in a minute that metadata, although the politicians um, tend to say that um, metadata does not really make a uh, doesn't have any relevance, we'll see in a minute that it does indeed. <clears throat> when you look at any um, privacy law, by the way, um, then uh, the privacy laws usually um, have another kind of um, uh, distinguish, or they distinguish the data again, where they say that, they, that there can be normal data with relation to individuals, but there can also be sensitive data with relation to ind individuals. And sensitive data, data usually is all the data that is linked to um, certain um, information that has been used in the past um, to discriminate against people. So, for example, ethnicity, political opinions, religious or philosophical beliefs, um, health-related data, biometrics, sexual preferences, and so on. Um, so, as soon as you have data with relation to individuals, be it content or metadata, that has any of um, that that allows you to infer any of this information you deal with sensitive data and then um, you should really talk to a lawyer because then processing this data um, from a legal perspective, uh, perspective gets really difficult. <clears throat> and then um, when we talk about relation uh, data with relation to individuals, we also have to distinguish between the way that people reveal this information. So a lot of the information is revealed consciously. So I'm sending a photo, I'm sharing a photo in Facebook, for example, this is a conscious data reveal uh, revelation. But there's a lot of um, data that is also revealed unconsciously. So for example, when I'm sharing um, data on Facebook, 
I'm sharing the information, uh, for example, that I have been at a certain place at a certain point in time, or that I'm using Facebook at a, at a certain point in, in time, and so on. Um, thinking, I, I, I always keep this um, side thought about law or about the legal situation. Um, usually, most of the um, uh, legal basis which we are using for processing um, private data or personal data at the moment is consent. So we ask the people, are you happy with, um, with using my service? Then please say yes. Um, but the consent has to be informed and it has to be conscious. So essentially using any uh, unconsciously revealed data, processing any unconsciously revealed data can never be covered by consent because the people do not know that they're sharing this. And then they can also not consent into processing um, this data. OK, um, so um, uh, keep, keep this in mind um, if you ever talk to um, people who want to um, deploy a new application and they say, oh, yeah, we just grab all of this information and we do with it whatever we want. You, you cannot do this based on consent if the data is revealed unconsciously. Anyways, um, I, have a, uh, I have a short case study, but yes, go ahead. Oh, so in this categorization, I mean, these types of data. So how about um, neural network models? So for example, I mean, this, I don't know, you know, this is neural network model themselves, just, they, they are just numbers. They are not related to a specific person. But if you look at how you obtain these numbers, then they are all derived from personal data, right? Yeah. So then in this case, or which category does this belong to? That's a very nice question, um, and thanks. So um, that's a that's a really good point. Uh, so there are two things here. So um, first of all, um, the uh, when you're saying that I learned some model, I, any kind of um, machine learned model, be it a neural network, be it a PCA, for example, you do a simple PCA, so principal component analysis. Um, then, um, then there are two two points to think about. The first point to think about is that um, at some stage you're training the model, right? Um, and uh, when you're training the model, you need the data. So, um, so if you have if you do not have consent by the by the users to actually use their data to train the model, then you cannot train the model um, because, uh, of course, there's a processing in the first case. And now the second question is: once let's say that the user said, you, I, "I allow you to train the model for the purpose of." of um, helping me to find a restaurant faster. Um, I'm, I'm willing to do that. And, and then you train the model. Uh, then the, quest, the next question is, does the, model, uh, it, does the model still relate to individuals or not? And as you were saying, the model seems seemingly, is seemingly only just a couple of numbers. Unfortunately, it's not. Um, so unfortunately, when we take uh, the more complex the models are, the easier it is to, to reconstruct training data from the model. So there are a lot of um, attacks um, that are known um, that you can use to reconstruct training data from models. So we just had a paper where we could show that that we can do membership. We call these membership inference or, or um, uh, data reconstruction attacks or model inversion attacks. Um, we just had a paper where we could show that even in PCA, so if, if you do a simple PCA, we can do membership inference attacks so we can um, confirm if certain data has been used in the PCA training or in the PCA learning essentially um, calculation. And um, when you think about uh, neural networks, you can extract lots of information from the neural networks again. Um, now there's a, um, uh, I think looking at the time, I would not get there today, but um, there's a, a whole bunch of research um, about um, uh, anonymizing this data. So um, what you can do is uh, you can essentially perturb the data during the training and um, or perturb the training process. That's, that's what we usually do. And, and then you can, um, that then you can prove that um, to, to, uh, to a large extent, an adversary will not be able to extract personal information from this data anymore or from, from this model anymore. Uh, but then what you have to do is, um, or the, the way that this works is usually that um, if you think about um, neural networks and uh, usually have, you have a stochastic gradient descent. Um, so essentially you have like, you apply your, your neural network um, on your input data and then you, you uh, calculate back what the, the gradients would be um, according to which you have to adapt the weights. And, um, and there is a differentially private stochastic, uh, stochastic gradient descent algorithm that essentially then takes a stochastic gradient descent, clips it to a unit vector, and perturbs it with a little bit of noise. Um, and then with this um, adapted training, um, you will get models where, to, um, where at least we know um, the, 
possibility or where we, where we can calculate the possibility of an adversary to reconstruct training data or to do membership in, uh, actually to um, to distinguish if certain information has been in the training data or not um, now in reality um, the the problem with this is that um, uh, now i was always talking about this uh, parameter how likely it is for an adversary and if we want to make it difficult for an adversary then we have to perturb the the training so much that the utility drops a lot and, and that's why we usually we agree that um, that um, we give the adversary the theoretical um, probability or we um, we accept a pro uh, theoretically high probability for the adversary to distinguish um, if um, certain training data has been used but at the same time we test with membership inference attacks with empirical methods um, if we ourselves knowing the entire training data would be able to distinguish um, uh, certain uh, data to have been in the training data or not knowing everything and knowing the model um, so if the, the model is trained in such a way then for the moment we would say okay so this model has been anonymized and and then essentially what you were saying is true so then it's only numbers um, at least um, in, in according to current to the current situation um, and um, but but this is a, a question of active research at the moment so if, if um, maybe there will be better attacks in the future and then maybe um, such a simple anonymization will not um, suffice thank you Got it. thank you just, just like as a as a takeaway, keep in mind just um, aggregating data, doing a PCA, training the uh, uh, neural network model or whatever, without anonymization um, mechanisms is not going to anonymize the, the model itself. <coughs> cool. Thanks a lot. Um, I like discussions. <laughs> um, okay. So getting back to the to the example here, so there's revelation of data consciously and unconsciously. I'm going to make this a comparatively brief. Um, I have a case study on social media where maybe let's say somebody has an Instagram profile or a Facebook profile or whatever, and um, I like to to discuss this with my students um, where there's some information that people knowingly explicitly share. That is the content that they create, comments that they create, or maybe if they like um, somebody or or some com uh, some post or if they make a contact. So this, of course, explicit, I do this, I, this is conscious to myself. Um, but there's a lot of information that is, that is shared unconsciously about myself. And, um, and uh, this information, uh, or the, the, um, this data gives a lot of information away. So it's only meta, metadata, but I can know, for example, when somebody's active, I know what they're interested in. I know their influence, how many people follow them, for example, I know, who's communicating um, where they are because maybe um, I know their IP address uh, or they share their location or I, have, I know the GPS coordinates in the, in the photos and so on. Um, I can train image recognition, image recognition models, personal, I can train models on personal details and so on. And only um, to, to um, uh, make matters worse, um, I highlighted some points here in red and these are the points that not only Facebook or Meta can do, of course, we would uh, say, OK, so I agree that Meta can do this because um, I, I want to use the service. But anybody who gets a Meta account can also crawl Meta, the, the data within Facebook or Instagram. And then anybody can, can train all of these uh, or can infer all of this information. So suddenly, again, we have the situation that we do not know who to trust anymore. And since everybody can, can create a Meta account or a Facebook Instagram account, everybody can do this. So um, you're sharing unconsciously with the whole world. It's uh, certainly not legal, but uh, here we are. Um, maybe just another uh, very quick side um, comment. Um, we did this um, in our, one of my classes. We call that class Facebook Mining. Um, and um, it's a class uh, where we take students um, that have no prior knowledge in machine learning. It's a single term lecture, so they get three months. Um, they crawl a couple of um, partial profiles and their neighborhoods. So essentially, they crawl profiles and then they crawl the profiles of the friends, so the social network, the social graph. And even students without much uh, machine learning knowledge are able to infer with very high accuracy the gender of, um, of certain profiles, hiding the gender, the age of the users, education levels, expected tenure with employers. So how often will you change your employer? Um, sexual preferences, um, uh, political preferences, and so on. And this, this is just, just what students do in one term without much prior knowledge um, crawling um, data from Facebook. There's a really nice article I'll keep this in the in the slides. Uh, private traits and attributes are predictable from digital records of on, uh, of human behavior. Um, it's uh, it's a very very nice article, only four pages that shows how much information you're actually sharing when you're using social media. 
Okay. Now, <clears throat> let's think about, again. I was saying so there are certain data and we have to think about the situation, right? Um, hang on, it's 856. Yeah, we, we can do this. Um, so let's talk about trust. Um, I was talking about um, the situation earlier that in, in classical security, we talk about Alice and Bob and they trust each other and they live in trusted domains and, um, and there's an adversary that is observing or interfering with each other. This is not the case anymore, right? So if we think about um, uh, our trust assumptions for privacy, um, and if I click, there should be something happening, exactly. So in the case of privacy, um, we don't even know if we can, if we can trust um, the service provider. Whoops. Yep, here we go. Um, because it may so happen that, um, uh, think about a whistleblower, a whistleblower may want to, sorry for that, a whistleblower may want to um, share some information about um, certain uh, things they have observed and they may want to share it with a journalist, but they may not even know if they can trust the journalist or if the journalist late, later on is pressured to reveal some, this information. Or let's say we have certain data that we, medical data, for example, that we want to have processed. Um, we don't know if, um, if the application is actually running in a cloud provider in, in, uh, in, any, uh, in any, any of the hyperscalers. So we don't know if we can trust the service provider. Now, if we have the situation where we own data and we just don't know if we can trust the service provider or not, um, then there are a lot, lot of um, uh, solutions that we have, um, mainly stemming from crypto, um, that are very well um, developed and, that, that, that then, uh, and which we can use. So what we usually call this general secure function uh, evaluation. Um, Alice is sharing certain information with the service provider, which she cannot uh, trust. Um, and, um, and then, for example, what we can uh, use is um, when we have untrusted professors, uh, <laughs> we also have untrusted professors sometimes, but in this case, it's untrusted processors. Um, then, for example, we can use homomorphic, homomorphic encryption. Uh, you may say that homomorphic encryption is not very um, performant at the moment. We're working on it. There's also secure multi-party computation, which is much more performant in many um, domains. Or there can be things like trusted execution, where then you do not trust the processor anymore. Um, but you just trust Intel, for example. So Intel is guaranteeing that even the administrator of the service cannot look into the data um, when you have trusted execution. Um, so this solves, um, to some extent, the, the problem uh, that, we, that we see in this case, where we do not tr trust the processor and where Alice only wants to process her own data. Um, now, sometimes we have the situation where, where there are more adversaries that we want to keep in mind. So um, Alice may also not trust her internet service provider. Um, Alice may also not know if she can trust somebody on the network. So again, let's say that there's metadata. What we saw before is only um, hiding content, um, but there's still metadata. Alice may, may not want um, the, service, uh, the internet service provider to know that she's communicating with Bob in the first place, um, being a whistleblower, for example. Um, Facebook may have customers that get access to the data and Alice may not trust the, uh, the customers of Facebook. Um, or Facebook may have um, additional entities that are helping uh, with the provision of the service. Um, for example, like um, Telcho ser um, service providers and Alice may not trust um, and, uh, these service providers as well. And um, so suddenly we are in a situation, in a situation where Alice may reside in a trusted domain locally, but other than that, um, for privacy, we would say let's not trust anybody. <laughs> um, let's let's reduce the amount of trust that we have that we need to have into anybody as much as we can. Um, and maybe the uh, strongest application that we see for that um, in that domain is um, processing or uh, uh, release um, revelation of aggregate private data. We're just um, talking about learning machine learning uh, training machine learning models. Um, to train machine learning models, we want to have some kind of data. Um, and uh, for that purpose, somebody has to release their private data, of course. Um, and uh, good applications could be that we have metaverse variables, right? So everybody's using variables um, and, uh, and meta has to collect this information because otherwise meta cannot show or cannot um, uh, let the others know how you walk around, what you're doing and so on. There may be smart city applications. It could also be just web surfing. So we just showed that in web surfing, um, when we can observe how you're surfing the web, if I run a web server, and you as a, as a um, web server are um, looking at or are, are um, accessing my web server, um, we can uh, detect if you are a, a potential candidate of OCD, of obsessive compulsive disorders. 
So even web surfing can be this kind of an application. Um, <clears throat> okay, and then what, what is the threat? The threat can be the disclosure of inputs um, and additional inference. So um, maybe the service provider would get um, information about the inputs and would be able to infer certain additional information. In this case, we could say, okay, so maybe um, we, we don't, I'm Alice, I don't really want to um, trust any other parties. Um, so I don't want to trust anybody else who's using uh, the metaverse, for example. Uh, but I may also know that um, Facebook may be sharing this information with certain analysts, and I may also not want to trust um, the analysts. Maybe I don't even want to trust the service provider themselves. And uh, very good examples for that can also be um, medical data, for example. So let's say that um, everybody's going to the hospital at some stage, um, uh, or every now and then, and we would like to be able to uh, learn as much information as possible um, <clears throat> from, from the medical um, information of as many different users as possible. Um, so then maybe I trust my own hospital, but um, I may not trust the analysts who, who get access to the medical data, right? I may also be in a situation where there are many different hospitals and maybe I don't want the other hospitals to know what my diseases are or, or the, the, the patients and the, the doctors in other hospitals. Um, so again, I, I want to be able to, um, to some extent, release private information about the users. I want to make it analyzable, um, or I want to um, uh, allow it. Um, I want to allow analysts to get access to the private data, but I don't really trust them. And and why would I not trust them? Well, in in some kind of a service, Facebook, for example, it may have happened that uh, there's somebody else who's using the service who um, who, who attacks the service. Or it could also be, of course, that there's an analyst that gets access to the data um, that, um, um, that we cannot trust. Now, the next question is, can we do this? And yes, indeed, we can as well. Um, so first of all, what we can do is anonymization. We can anonymize the data. Um, this is actually much more difficult than we may think. And I have a um, 100 slides of that. <laughs> um, but we'll, we'll uh, cut them short a little bit. Um, and the second attempt is um, to apply techniques from statistical disclosure control. Um, so for example, usually statistical disclosure control is also going to try to um, use some kind of anonymization techniques um, and then um, at least be able to tell exactly which um, information about the individuals is actually leaking. You may have heard about differential privacy. That's one of the techniques for stat statistical disclosure control where we can calculate exactly how much information the adversary will actually learn about each of the individuals that is participating or that is um, that is participating in, in the database. Um, okay, <clears throat> now um, when I say all this, um, of course, there's still the question of, of relationship to, individu uh, to individuals. And, um, and again, um, just to make this slightly more clear, let's talk about this kind of, usually when we, we talk about relationship, we are the domain, we talk about linkability and the risk of disclosure. Um, so in general, when we, th when we talk anonymization or, or privacy, then, then we talk about protecting individuals from abuse, uh, abuse of data about them. And that means that um, an adversary, or in the case of a data loss incident with the public, can link items of interest with some probability. Now, what are these exemplary items of interest? One item of interest usually is the individual. So me as an individual can be one item of interest. It could also be the identity of the sender of a message or the receiver of a, of a message, sometimes even just an intermediate who is forwarding a message, sometimes even just pseudonyms. So a pseudonym for an individual that allows to, to link um, data um, for dig digital dossier aggregation, for example. So this kind of um, information about an individual very often is one type of uh, item of interest. But it can also be some kind of auxiliary information. For example, the content of the message um, is it's uh, very obvious, of course, but it could also be something like locations, um, the interest, um, for example, web pages on diseases. If I'm if I'm going to certain web pages of certain religious beliefs, politi uh, political, radical opinions, and so on, um, so this could be auxiliary information. And and then uh, and then of course now linkability means that I can always you know, always means that I can either um, link uh, two individuals or usually an individual to some kind of this auxiliary information. Now, when we talk about threats, we talk about the risk of disclosure, then what types of disclosures can we have? First, of course, um, we have the disclosure of identity. Um, so it would mean that I can identify somebody, right? But there's a secondary risk of disclosure, with, which is this disclosure of attributes, so the attributes of certain users or individuals. Now, for the first one, 
That's really obvious. I mean, um, so um, if we think about disclosure of identity, I mean, I can identify an individual, for example, in the, in the data set, um, or I can link an identity to an observation. So I see that somebody sent a message, and now I can link the individual that has sent the message um, to the message. What does the disclosure of attributes mean? Um, this means that um, beyond the fact that I can identify a user, I can also infer a hidden um, attribute of an individual. So, for example, let's say um, that you have a Facebook profile or any kind of social media profile, but you don't want to share certain information, for example, your political interest or whatever, um, then the disclosure of attribute means um, that I, as an adversary, am able to link this, um, this information, for example, your political interest to you as an, identity, uh, as an individual. So these are usually the threats. Now, <clears throat> thinking about um, linking identities to data, um, we usually do this um, uh, using NIMS. Um, so there's usually some identifying information. Um, and uh, I'm going to be really brief here because a lot of them are really obvious. Um, so for example, um, there can be names, right? Or there can be um, just literals. There can be, uh, hang on, there can be names, personal names, Akash, Torsten, whatever. Um, there can be service numbers. Some of us have served in the army, and that, of course, is a perfect um, uh, um, identifier of an individual. Portrait pictures. Um, the, our DNA, of course, is the um, strongest link, um, much stronger than the names, because, um, for example, in my case, Thorsten Strufe, there are two Thorsten Strufe in the world, so the name doesn't link. Um, uh, it's not a very strong identifier. As a, matter, as a matter of fact, my DNA, of course, is a much stronger identifier. These are really obvious identifiers. Maybe a little bit less obvious is, of course, that um, from DNA, you can not only identify myself, but also my family relationships, and you learn a lot of, a lot of attributes, for example, exposure to certain di uh, diseases and so on. There are slightly less obvious technical pseudonyms. For example, there can be cookies, IP addresses, or handles. Um, for example, my handle at KIT. Also, referrals can contain pseudonyms. Um, for example, I mean, in this case, it's just a name. Um, that uh, if there's this uh, unique information that can uh, link an observation to an individual. Again, less obvious, sometimes you will say, well, um, there's, there are low entropy ent attributes, um, for example, date of birth or, or the gender, or maybe the postal code um, of, of where somebody lives. And you may say, well, each of these is not really relevant because they have so little entropy that you will not be able to uh, identify an individual. However, as soon as you have a tuple of the three, there's a nice paper by Latanya Sweeney, that shows that if you know the date of birth, not even the year, just the day of the birth, the gender and the postal code, then you can identify 87% of the American, of the US American um, population, just by the three tuples, uh, by the tuple of the three information, date of birth, gender and postal code. Three very low entropy attributes, but in combination, they're, they're sufficient. Browser fingerprints, um, again, are, um, it's more obvious that they, are, that they suffice to identify um, individuals, but they're less obvious in the sense that we usually don't um, realize that we are sharing browser uh, fingerprints with others. And then, um, again, less obvious are biometrics. Okay, everybody knows that you can ident identify somebody from their fingerprint or from their iris, um, but um, what people do not know commonly is that, um, that you can also identify users by their heartbeat, for instance, and you can actually collect information about the heartbeat from kilometers away if you shine lasers at their, at their skin. Um, it's sufficient to identify users. Um, limb proportions. So if, I, if you give me your hand, um, then um, just by the proportions of your fingers, I can identify many different users. You know about the teeth um, and so on. Posture is an identifying low entropy, uh, entropy attribute. So you can ad identify a lot of people. You can distinguish a lot of people, a lot of people just by the postures. Okay, and then um, to make matters worse, we are talking about behavioral data, right? And um, behavioral data comes as time series information. So, um, so we have sequences of symbols essentially. So, um, sorry, so they're giving away um, behavioral or, or, um, in, uh, or habitual information. If we have sequences of actions, for example, um, looking at the web, um, just the way that people serve the web is giving away their identity. We can show that, um, that we can identify users by the way that they're using the web. If I have time later on, I'm going to show the example. Um, if you think about gait, the way that people walk um, is a perfect identifier. Just by being able to observe the walking, um, the gait of an, uh, an individual, you can distinguish many, many different people. The locations, obvious uh, identifier. If you know where somebody lives and then you also know if you don't only know where sorry, don't only know where somebody lives, but you also know where on a regular basis they go to work, 
these two information are perfectly sufficient to identify pretty much anybody internationally, globally. Um, so, of course, um, now there are different types of locations, um, but of course, these are obviously um, highly um, identifying information. And uh, now, very often, what we say is that, okay, so we, we still want to um, process this kind of information. You recall the examples that I showed at, at the be beginning of the tutorial. So, for example, we want to be able to um, process the way that people are moving. And then you would say, okay, so maybe we can uh, anonymize this data. But it um, turns out that anonymizing such kind of sequential information is really, really, really difficult. And why is that the case? That, that of course, is the case because, first of all, there's very, very strong um, correlation in the data. Um, if I know where, where your uh, foot is in one point, at one point in time, with very high likelihood, I know where your foot is at the next point in time because I know the correlation of the movement, um, obvious. Um, also, um, if I want to um, anonymize, usually I have to make sure that the probabilities for different um, potential data points um, are more, more or less the same. But of course, in the case of such kind of data, this is, this is impossible, right? So if I, if I anonymize, let's say, my second point um, of, in my trajectory and I place this to the United States, um, then, uh, then the probability for this point to be the real data is much, much higher than for me to be suddenly in the United States because I'm not the flesh. Um, so, um, uh, or if I, if I anonymize over-anonymized data in the gates, um, that would look, look like you broke your leg suddenly and then suddenly it's, uh, it's fine again. So anonymizing this kind of data is really, really quite difficult. Um, okay, and then just uh, before the break, um, let's, uh, let's still try, try to recap this. Um, um, so what we want to achieve is we want to achieve unlinkability. And in, in essence, um, we don't, don't need to go to all of the details here. In essence, what, what un unlinkability means for us is that um, if all of the data points from are uh, unlinkable from, from each other, and, we, and they're also unlinkable from any kind of um, uh, individual, then we achieve anonymity. And only if we have anonymous data, we're happy with processing the data. Um, okay, so now um, my next step would be to, to look at um, attempts um, of achieving unlinkability. And, and I would um, say that uh, I would try to convince you that it's not even quite so easy, but maybe let's um, just have like a two minute coffee break where everybody can run and get a coffee. Um, let's say that we meet, I think, in, according to my time, it's um, 13 past your local hour. Um, so let's say we meet at 20 past your local hour, and, um, and then I, I, we, we would reconvene, if that's fine. Hi, Thorsten. Morning. I'm good, thanks. How are you? Good. I just got my coffee already. <laughs> we can use it. The talk is really interesting, but I'm wondering, I mean, uh, you mentioned a lot of questions actually about uh, how it is difficult to ensure privacy, et cetera, but then what's the solution? Yeah, so actually I have, <laughs> I have three parts of this tutorial and the third part goes into the solutions. Unfortunately, I think I won't get there. Um, yeah, probably not. But I mean, the way you describe it, any app which I have installed on my phone, any app which could be on my wife's phone or my friend's phone or whatever, can anyhow track uh, so much information about us. So yeah. is there any use trying to fight it or uh, not? Well, I mean, so, so um, there are two, two uh, points to that. Um, so first of all, um, uh, there are privacy-friendly apps, right? So you can use an app that, that only collects the data that they need. Um, so for example, if you have a step counter, there are step counter apps that, that do not use the cloud and they only, they only um, use the data that they need. They process, process it only for the need. They don't share it with anybody else. And then it's fine. I mean, so of course they could do more. Um, but uh, if I if I can trust the app provider, then this this is not not a big issue, right? So then then there is a possibility to do this in a way that is not privacy invasive. But like you mentioned, right? I mean, Apple and uh, Android, for example, Google, they already have. Uh, they can always get even that app data out, unless the app can somehow encrypt the data which is stored in the even the mobile phone itself can't get the information, the OS itself, right? Yeah. But as a user, it's really hard to know which apps there are, and to I think the owner should be actually then on the maybe the app store uh, app stores to basically enforce that no apps can really provide the data further or store it in the cloud etc so i mean this would break their business model right because they're, yeah. they're, the moment their business model is that they're selling the data to to data brokers and um so uh, so the apps not the not the 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 app stores 
um, but the apps essentially just um, sell the data to data brokers. So, so that would break the business model of many of the apps. Um, but indeed, I think that um, <clears throat> that um, I, I think there are two two um, talking about trust again. There are two entities that um, that we require. We require trust to some extent into Google and Apple, so that they make sure that um, so first of all that they do not get access to the to the data which they could. Um, I think this is also maybe a given because um, uh, their reputation loss would be much too high to, to for example, access the, the um, Corona warn-up data, right? So they could, mm -hmm. but if they were caught, their reputation damage would be so high that, that it wouldn't make sense. And um, uh, so there's, we have to, to um, have a little bit of trust into these providers. Um, also, I think that the regulation plays, plays a big role, right? So we need the, the data privacy laws that we have or maybe even stricter privacy laws, then we have them. And then we need audits. I mean, um, we just need to, uh, so um, maybe since um, since uh, we were talking about privacy friendly apps, it would be possible to actually go against apps that are not privacy friendly, that are selling. So th for example, I was talking about this ovulation tracker earlier. Um, um, there was a big um, uproar because they were um, selling data to China and mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, it's ridiculous that this is the case, but there was a, they were saying, no, it's impossible that you sell the data to China, so they stopped selling, selling the data to China. They still sell it, sell it to the United States, which is, which is ridiculous, right? Um, so it's ridiculous to make the distinction, but, uh, um, but if you put some pressure on, um, on the app providers um, from a legal basis, I think that's the first, that, that would also be a first step. And we need audits. Uh, we, we, need, um, we, need that, um, we need a situation where the um, institutions who are upholding the privacy laws um, do audits and and find the people who are culprits. I mean, um, to to me, to some extent, this is very similar to the situation with um, with consumer rights or also with the rights of employers. I mean, like 150 years ago, um, com consumers didn't have any rights, and employers could treat their their employees like slaves, essentially, right? But at some stage, um, there was some law that developed, and and um, and in this case, again, the seemingly weaker um, party in this um, relationship um, with help of the regulator got into a, a situation or got, got into the, the position um, where the um, where they are much not not much stronger but where, where their rights are much better protected and mm -hmm. um, I think this is uh, something that we have to do in this case as well it's, it's well, i guess at some point if you look at it i mean it's also a matter of how much benefits do i get from these app right so it could be that if i disable everything possible no sharing in the across the cloud etc uh, but then I also get less benefits actually. Thank you to actually use the app, right? But if I don't allow these kind of sharings and all, then I have to really manage myself all the data, which is also messy. Yeah, sure. <laughs> it's a kind of a trade-off: how much benefits, how much convenience you want to have, and how much you're willing to share of your data with these apps and uh, providers. Yeah, I mean, also the the benefits of the app developers, right? So um, if at the moment there's there's uh, no repercussion, so if if I as a, an app developer I, I grab all of the information and I sell it. Um, I have no problem with that. Um, mm -hmm. But as soon as there's like a trade-off um, that I have to make, um, because maybe I'm, I'm suddenly fined if I sell the data, well, then maybe I, I focus on the data that I really need for the functionality mm -hmm. and, and I don't grab more information and sell it off. So, so um, there's the second kind of a, an entity where we, have, where we should have a trade-off. We don't have it yeah. yet, but um, maybe it's fine. Yeah, if they have no penalty to misuse the data, they might as well do it. <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. Good point, yeah. Thanks. Very cool. Uh, by the way, um, just it's 9.20, so I should restart, but um, I'll be in Dresden next week. Oh, okay. Um, then uh, let's catch up. Just drop me a note which days you are here. Um, I, I'll, uh, I'll, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll send you a message. Perfect. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks a lot once again to give the lecture. Very interesting. I'm happy about that. <laughs> cool, okay. <clears throat> so thanks, Akash. Um, Thanks everybody else for being back probably. Um, I cannot really quite see if there's, ah yes, here we go. So that everybody seems, seems to be back. So then let's keep going. <clears throat> so um, I was saying that um, uh, we want to achieve unlinkability or maybe I should just restart this. This is slide 50 because we can really slow. Uh, here we go, I hope that's gonna, Speed up things again. Okay, so um, I was saying that uh, we want to achieve unlinkability or anonymity of the data. And, um, and very often, um, <laughs> many people are claiming that they do achieve anonymity or that they anonymize <clears throat> data. 
um, or that they even developed effective anonymization. Um, but uh, we'll see in a moment that um, uh, maybe this is not always as much the case as, as they claim. And uh, <clears throat> I have an overview of four of the studies that we've been doing in our lab um, over the last uh, one and a half years. And um, uh, we, we just, uh, I will go through maybe the first two of them and then I guess the time is going to be out, uh, run out. So then I will open the floor for questions. And then maybe if you have questions regarding the, the last two, then we can uh, have a look at them again. Um, um, but the first question is essentially what that we were asking is how fast we can identify users in seemingly anonymized web tracking data. So you know that um, Google, um, Facebook, Amazon, uh, Apple, and many, many uh, third party trackers are tracking how you're using the web. And uh, we were trying to figure out how quickly it would be possible to identify a user in such kind of data. Um, the second question that we were asking is, um, let's assume that somebody is constantly deleting cookies like I do. <laughs> um, then, uh, then suddenly you don't have like a long session um, that, uh, about the user behavior, um, but you have short sessions. And we wanted to figure out um, that um, uh, how quickly it would be possible to learn typical behavior in web sessions, or in this case, also in GPS trajectories. Um, and then assuming that even if um, after each of the session, the identifier would be, um, would be renewed, so you, you delete your cookies, you get a new cookie, um, how reliably we would be able from the patterns in the short sessions um, to re-identify the users across sessions. Um, the first, uh, the third study that we're currently publishing is how well we can reverse anonymization of facial images. So you may have um, uh, seen that um, plenty of people are publishing papers where they're saying that they effectively anonymize faces, and um, so that you can anonymize your own face before you upload it to, to um, Facebook, and um, people will not even realize. But machine learning models are broken. Um, we tried to figure out to which extent this this claim is correct, and turns out um, with um, exempt uh, or with the exception of very, very few in, uh, approaches, um, they're all ineffective. And the third, uh, the fourth question that we're asking is if we can anonymize gate. It's not even to which extent or how well, but um, we're trying to ask the question if we can anonymize gate in the first place. Um, but I go through them, and as I was mentioning, I may, I, I'll, I'll quit maybe at around 9:45 so that we have time for questions. And um, if any of these other, if I don't manage to um, pre uh, present any of the last ones. And you're interested in them, in them, just get back to me and then we can um, look at them briefly. <clears throat> okay, so the first one, your anonymity in web tracking data asks how fast we can ident identify um, users in what um, trackers say is anonymous web tracking data. Um, so uh, bear in mind that um, your web trackers aren't even trying to anonymize, anonymize your data, but sometimes in Europe, some of the trackers claim that they anonymize the data, for example, by deleting the last octet of the IP address. That's what, face, uh, that's what Google says, for example. Or they're claiming that they anonymize in other ways. And, and we want to look at these ways and figure out if, if they're actually effective or not. How can we do that? Um, so we cooperate with Inf Online. Inf Online is um, a German um, uh, audience measurement company. What does audience measurement mean? So essentially, you know that um, on the web, uh, most of the money is made with advertisement. And in order to to claim certain prices for your real estate on your web page, um, you want to claim uh, gazillions of visitors and, and page views. So you want you want to be able to say, I have so many visitors every day. So let's say Nicecom is cla claiming gazillions of visitors and page views. Um, so then Nicecom can claim um, the advertisement agencies to pay fantastillions of dollars or euros or whatever. Now, of course, the agencies don't want that. That's why they have independent audit bureaus of circulations. Um, they have also been existing in, in the printing press already, but um, now they exist in the digital, digital sphere. And what they do is they, they are independent of the market, um, but they count the number of visitors to web pages um, in order to make participants comparable. So um, in, ter in terms of the websites and the ad performance. What they do, of course, is they um, implement trackers. So it's third party scripts, scripts that are embedded in the web pages. Um, the third party scripts deride, uh, uh, redirect the visitors to the auto of circulation in online in our case. Um, and then um, they count uh, how often you visit which of the pages. Um, it's done by cookies, of course, not very, um, not very surprising. And, um, and uh, the cookies also allow to, to re-identify users as long as, the, as long as the cookies exist. So essentially they have long, long sessions of um, people browsing the web. 
Uh, what do they do with the data? At the moment, they simply store it in, in a massive data lake. And that's not something we should um, we should say out loud, but um, that's what ha what's happening at the moment. And um, and we get access to this data and we can run our analysis on this data. So what is the service that they provide? So the advertisers want to know, first of all, the page um, impressions. And that's um, is essentially specific per rendered page. So if, uh, let's say, you go to CNN.com and you uh, read an article at CNN.com, <clears throat> then um, the advertisers don't only want to know that somebody read that article but they also want to know for example your browsers your platform um, and so on so for each of the different rendered pages there's a code the code may be an article on the exploded bridge in um, in ukraine um, rendered for a, a samsung smartphone um, with a certain screen resolution so that's a specific code for the page and um, and these code impressions is what the advertisers uh, advertisers want to have they also want to know the visits. Visits would be consecutive sessions um, at the same page, essentially. Um, and now, how do they define sessions? They say, well, a session of a user is the activity uh, as long as uh, the time that a user is active until they take a break for 30 minutes or longer. So as long as, as you have consecutive clicks, where each of the click is less than 30 minutes um, after the previous click, the session uh, keeps going, and only if there's a um, a break of 30 minutes or longer, then um, this is counted as the next visit. Also, they want to know the clients per period. So for example, they want to know the unique visitors, um, for example, at between 12 and one o'clock on Monday or between eight and nine o'clock Sunday morning um, when I'm giving my tutorial. So this is the service that um, the ABCs are, are asked to provide. How do they do that? I already said that roughly, what do they store? They store the site. Um, so that would be CNN, for example, example, the category that would be, for example, uh, politics or sports or whatever. Um, they store the page, for example, um, explosion on a, on a bridge in Ukraine. Um, and that would be the code, as I was mentioning above um, the rendered page. They also store the location. In this case, what they do is they take the GIP region from the IP address and then they throw away the IP address. So they still know if you are in Germany, in Switzerland, um, but they, they don't have information much more um, detailed than that. And they have the timestamp in milliseconds. So the timestamps, of course, locally when you hit the, the web server of the, of the ABC. In the, in the data set that we're, lo that we're looking at, we have two to three billion page impressions per day. Um, for the paper that we wrote, that was one week's worth of, um, of data. Um, so uh, seven days. Um, <laughs> then the the uh, reviewers at, in Oakland were saying that they wanted a whole month. So then we did the, the same thing again over a whole month, um, but the results were the same. Um, so that's essentially the data that we're analyzing. And of course, I no need to say that um, that this is highly personal and identifiable information because essentially your, your, your cookie information is in there. And no matter which web page you're using that also implements the, uh, the tracker or the, um, the audience measurement, um, is in, included in the in the database, and there are political parties. There are um, web pages about uh, certain medical discussions and so on that are included in the database. Okay, got some more detail. How does it look like browsing data? Let's say we have, for similar for simple simplicity reasons, let's say we have the cookie number one. Um, then we have a timestamp on, millis on the out of millis milliseconds. We have this code, as I was mentioning, the URL and the environment, and then there's a function over it. We have the site, for example, google.com, category, category search, location, for example, North Rhine-Westphalia or Baden-Württemberg in Germany, so the federal states. Um, they're ordered by identifier and timestamp. Um, we have certain different data fields, of course. Each of the clicks um, of the user provides one event. Um, then the entirety of the events um, uh, uh, yields a trace um, that we can um, collect about the user. We cut the traces into the browsing sessions, as I was mentioning, <clears throat> and um, and this is done by the uh, essentially just using the the 30 minute um, rule that the um, industry has has or is applying at the same time. Um, okay, now now of course, um, even if I tell you this, then then it should be obvious that um, that this data is is uh, this would not be GDPR compliant because uh, you you get very highly detailed information about uh, user behavior and it's very highly identifying. So what industry does is they say, okay, um, we anonymize this data. And um, what usually is done is um, that they use generalization. And what does generalization mean? The idea of generalization is that if you have detailed information, let's say you have the information about four different trees, 
um, you remove the detail and you, you generalize it to the next higher, less, less detailed um, type of information. For instance, let's say that you have IP addresses. Generalization would mean that if you take all of these IP addresses and you cut off the last two octets in this case, um, then you would have some kind of anonymization by generalization because the detail is, is deleted and suddenly there's no single individual identified by this information anymore. The goal, of course, would be some kind of K anonymity. K anonymity um, says that um, there is at least K uh, individuals that share the same data in the data set. Um, and then the question for us would be, so let's, let's say that somebody is doing generalization on this click track, uh, um, on this click database, on this uh, web tracking database. Um, after generalization, which K is achieved? So do we have like two or three or four or five individuals that share the identical information? It uh, turns out we never achieve any kind of K anonymity by generalization. So, so this is not an, a metric that works. Instead, what we do is we calculate the unicity. And the unicity essentially says um, uh, to, to uh, which extent are the individuals, no, um, which fraction of individuals is still uniquely identifiable. So let's say that um, half of the individuals by generalization are anonymized, but the other half is still identifiable because the data is unique then unicity would be 50%. And um, what we also do is, um, we, we, so this is a standing uh, metric. We also uh, defined identifiability where we're, trying, where we're trying to figure out how little information suffices um, to actually identify an individual. So saying, do I need one or two or three or four observations of the individual to then uniquely identify their click trace in the database. So that we, that's what we call identifiability. Because then of course, um, with unicity, you, you don't necessarily already learn anything new because you're only able to identify the sequence of clicks of an individual. But with unicity, that could mean that you, you need to know the entirety of all of the clicks. With identifiability, it means that you only know a subsequence of, of the entirety of the clicks. You find the sequence of the, of the clicks of the individual in the database, and then you, you learn all of this information that you didn't have before. That's why I said, or that's why I write then learning attributes. Okay, how can that work? <clears throat> so how can I generalize click traces? We were talking about site, categories, pages, and codes, location, client, environment, IP, timestamp, and milliseconds. Um, so these are the data fields that we have. We already said we ignore the cookies and the IP addresses. Um, so what can we still generalize? We can either um, uh, generalize the client. The only information that we have about the client is their location. So we can consider or we can delete the location of the client. Um, that's the only information that we have about the client. Then we can generalize the page or click information. So we can delete the code or we can de delete the category. Um, we can even delete the entire site. Deleting the page doesn't really make much sense because it's just in the middle between the code and the categories. We could do that too, we didn't. Um, the second information that we have about each click is the um, timestamp. So when did somebody click? And of course we can also um, generalize the timestamps. We have them in milliseconds. It's unlikely that, that two people click on the same exact link at the same exact millisecond. Um, so we, we will have to um, reduce the detail of the timestamps um, in order to generalize the click information. And, and then there's some meta information, um, which is the length of the traces. So even if I only know the number of clicks that you performed, I will be able to identify um, your click trace in the database with high likelihood. Um, so that's why, of course, we can also cut the trace into certain uh, minima, minima or maxima. So we can say that we delete all of the traces which are shorter than a certain amount, or we could say that we cut all of the traces in specific to specific link. Now, <clears throat> what would that mean? Let's say we know about Alice and Bob, that both of them went to Spiegel Online at different times from different locations. Well, if we delete the location, if we coarsen the time, and if we cut the click traces, then for these two examples, we would be able to anonymize them to a K of two anonymity of two, because then we would not be able of, um, of, uh, to distinguish um, these two click traces when we know them. Um, okay, so this is what we did in the study um, to try to figure out if this kind of generalization um, actually has an effect. We did this to extremes. Um, we did it to a trace length of only a single click. Um, we del deleted all of the information, um, save the site. So only knowing that you went to CNN um, and to the, the time to the day of the visit. So removing all of the hours or minutes or seconds information, um, <clears throat> but only um, reducing this information to the day of the visit. Um, we published this in uh, 2020 actually at um, 
at Oakland. Again, my browser is slow, my apologies. The paper cited, titled Browsing Unicity, what you see here, um, is, the, is the overall unicity plot, which is the most interesting information really for, of the first part of the study. It shows us the unicity, so how many, uh, which fraction of the users is uniquely identify, identifiable after um, applying the um, generalization and anonymization. Um, we see on the x-axis the timestamp coarsening. So if we um, coarsen the timestamps, and we start by 10 seconds, so it's not milliseconds, it's not seconds, we start at 10 seconds, um, going up to the um, coarseness of an entire day. Um, and then what you see here up here is essentially the plot. Um, if we would inf uh, take all of the information, um, the location um, of, of the user, the code of the site, uh, the site itself, and we would um, keep all of the length information in the um, about the trace um, by when when we try to identify the user. And then you see that um, for keeping all of this information, pretty much 100% of the users are identifiable, even if we course into 10 seconds. And, uh, and still over six, uh, just under 60% of the users are still identifiable if we remove all of the time information, save the day. So we only know on this day, somebody um, uh, used, um, sorry, uh, performed certain tricks. And now the frustrating point of the, of the plot is um, that even if we delete all of this information, so we only take the length of the click trace um, and the timestamps, we delete even the site information. We don't even know where you, uh, which web page you're browsing to. Um, then if we have a timestamp coarseness of 10, per, of 10 seconds, over 60% over of the uh, click traces are identifiable. So 60%, over 60% of the click traces are unique, even if you delete all of this information, just by the length of the click trace and the timestamps at a level of 10, of, of 10 seconds, at a granularity of 10 seconds. And only if we go on the order to the order of like um, of hours, like six, uh, six hours, then this starts to it, uh, get near any kind of K anonymity where then K would be something like two. Um, so this is um, slightly um, frustrating, um, of course, uh, because this would be entirely useless information for the for the advertisers. And um, now there are a couple of other plots in the in the in the paper that I won't um, show now. Now, if we start cutting the length of the click traces, the situation gets slightly better, but the unicity still retains high. Um, so then, of course, the second question that we were asking was. Um, uh, let's say that um, we only observe a certain number of clicks. So let's say that um, I'm sharing a, a couple of um, links on Twitter. You can, uh, you know, my Twitter account, so you can see which links I shared. Um, you may roughly know um, uh, the state of my origin. So you, you may know that now I'm in Germany, in uh, Baden-Württemberg. Um, you know the visited domain because I shared the link. And we cropped the sessions to 10 clicks. So we, we, uh, we, we allowed only 10 clicks of session length. And then we try to figure out um, how quickly, after how many clicks, can we identify these sessions in the database. Um, and it turns out that if we course into the order of minutes, um, then a single click already um, allows to identify 20% of, of all of the sessions. Um, if we see, if we observe four clicks, if you share four, um, uh, four of the pages that you visited on Twitter, um, then course into to, to the order of minutes, we can identify, uh, identify more than 60% of the session, uh, sessions. And it means that you learn all of the other information um, that you haven't seen before afterwards, of course. And even if we coarsen the, the clicks to the order of weeks, so not even hours or days, but um, even if we uh, coarsen the, the timestamp granularity on the order, to the order of weeks, even then after two clicks, um, we can identify um, click sessions. After three clicks, we can identify on the order of four or 5% of the click sessions. And after 10 clicks, we can identify 10% of the sessions. Um, so, um, so essentially, um, what I want to say is um, uh, using generalization in this kind of um, uh, data in order to anonymize the data is entirely ineffective. So, um, so you will not, you want to achieve K anonymity to have any kind of anonymity, any kind of unlinkability, but you don't. Of course, now for us, the, um, the task is um, that we have to do something and we're working on it. So we're working together with the advertisement industry um, and building be better audience measurement um, solutions that will then actually be um, anonymous. Okay, that was the first. Um, then maybe I'll, I'll take five minutes for the second because I think the results are also quite interesting and, and quite impressive. 
where then um, we were thinking, okay, so in the database before, um, we used all of the sessions in, in their entirety. So, um, so the, the cookies survive in, in many cases for several months. <clears throat> now, but um, some people will say, okay, but after every session, so in my case, for example, every half an hour roughly, I delete my cookies, and then I think I'm safe, right? Because uh, there's only a certain number of observations that the adversaries can make, and maybe um, uh, these are not enough to learn a lot more from. But then we were thinking, okay, so I also know that every morning at seven o'clock I go to certain web pages, so there is some regularity in the click traces or in the sessions. And then we were thinking, so how quickly can we actually um, re-identify such kind of sessions based on the similarity between the different sessions? Um, we did this on two types of data. The first is the web browsing data that we saw before. And the second is mobility data because we're also working with smart city um, providers um, that want to um, collect um, mobility trajectories. Um, I don't need to say much about the type of data. Um, suffice to say that um, hang on, um, that we, uh, in the case of the mobility data, what we have is we again have the identifier of the users, we have the timestamps, and in this case we have the GPS coordinates. Um, now this is um, uh, conceptually different from the data that we had before, because of the data that we had before, we had cate categorical data, and now suddenly we have this numerical data of the of the um, of the location. Um, so what we did is essentially we did some reverse uh, geocoding, and then essentially for each of the events, um, we reverse geocoded um, the GPS coordinates back into some kind of categorical data. So for example, the street address, postcode, country, and so on. So then the same kind of an analysis applies that we saw before. Um, again, we said that um, we have a database from several different users. Each of the users uh, has several different sessions. Um, so we assume that after every session, 30 minutes break um, constitutes a session. Um, so after every session, we assume that the um, user is deleting their cookies. So we have um, a new pseudonyms for each of these sessions. And we also say that the adversary can observe certain traces. So let's say that the ad adversary can observe trace A, uh, one and four from user A. The adversary can observe um, trace one and two from a uh, session one and two from user B. And the adversary can um, observe session one and three from user C. And then there are non-observable traces in the data set. And let's say that we have the target data, uh, data uh, the target session seven. So now the, the, um, the task of the adversary, of course, would be to figure out who does this target trace belong to? And uh, uh, the, um, the only information that the adversary gets is the blue, dark blue traces. Here. And <clears throat> essentially what we then, then do, of course, is that um, from, uh, in a simple point, uh, from a simple point of view, we compare this target trace to the um, sessions that the um, adversary observed, and we calculate the closest similarity between the target trace and all of the observed traces. And then finally, we say, if we have the highest similarity, our, our hypothesis is that um, the observed trace with the highest similarity to the target trace would then identify the user um, that has um, to, to which the target trace pertains. So this is actually how we designed our experiment. Um, we did this in three different ways. Um, the first way was just to use histograms. So of course we can uh, we can represent our uh, sessions as uh, histograms. I'm not going to go there again, but it's obvious, of course. And we compared histograms. The second thing was that we used um, uh, sequence alignment approaches that didn't work very well. And the third approach is that we um, used neural networks. Um, more specifically, we, use, we used a Siamese neural network, um, where essentially we always had traces, um, two input traces, um, either of the same user, um, then learning and embedding that would identify or that would um, train um, the, the, the output, the embedding to have an, a low distance between traces that are generated by the same user or a high distance um, if the traces were generated by different users. And indeed, we, we, um, we did this with triplet, triplet loss. So we also always had three input traces where we always had two um, input traces from the same user and one input trace from an alternative user to then improve the, the training, essentially. Um, lots of information about the details of the training that the, public, the paper is hopefully going to be published soon. Uh, but I can also share the information with, with you if you're interested. Now, if we, um, if we try to re-identify the data in the browsing data set that we saw before, then our Siamese network-based approach um, achieves, um, we distinguish between top 1, top 10, and top 10% um, in a perfect accuracy in 80% of the cases. 
So let that sink in. <laughs> uh, I only see two of your browsing sessions and then I get a target browsing session from you um, and I can, in 80% of the cases, I can identify you just based on the regularity in your browsing behavior. If I'm willing to, uh, to investigate 10 different people, um, then this increases to 90, over 90, 95%. So in 95% of the cases, the actual um, victim is in the top 10 of the output of the Siamese network. Um, <clears throat> the situation looks a little bit different for the mobility data set. Um, so the mobility data set, um, we can only, uh, so I did not tell you how much data we had in the mobility data set, but in the mobility data set, indeed, we took all of the traffic around Dresden um, for a month. And, um, and it turns out that in the mobility data set, um, the, the regularity in the behavior is much lower than we were expecting. And we can only um, identify perfectly around about uh, nine, uh, eight or nine percent of, of the individuals seeing two mobility sessions and then getting a third mobility session as a victim or as a target mobility session. Um, if we increase the number of sessions that, um, that the adversary sees, then of course the um, results go up. Um, but this was the assumptions that we took. Um, in the top 10, we, we reach roughly 15%. So um, indeed, um, uh, a slightly lower result. We have a couple of hypotheses why this is the case, um, but I don't have the time to go too much into detail. Um, so deleting cookies doesn't really help, as we can see, because we can identify your sessions again. By the way, also neither does clipping, heading, or trailing segments. So what industry does in the case of mobility data at the moment is that they say we simply cuts off the first 200 meters or the first three minutes of a mobility session. And we do the same at the end of the trajectory. And, uh, and then this information was um, so much generalized that it was an, uh, anonymous. We did the same experiment cutting exactly like industry does and the results look the same. So there's no difference. Um, so this is, um, yes, uh, it doesn't really help. Okay, um, so these were the first two um, use cases from uh, from uh, our lab. Um, there's another one. I'm just going to show you roughly what we're doing, but I'm not going to go through the details. Um, um, so the, ident the idea, of course, is that uh, that people say that they that they can anonymize facial images, and um, uh, my virtual machine is slow at the moment. Exactly. So, and usually what then happens is, whoops, um, is <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, let me directly find the slide. Um, here we go. So usually what, what uh, the papers claim is that they can uh, anonymize um, the faces in such a way that um, that the facial image was not, was not um, re-identifiable by machine learning algorithms. And um, very simple, um, simply put, what, um, what the approaches um, suggest is either some kind of permutation um, or to have some Gaussian noise in the image data um, or some pixelations um, or some overlaying um, additional image information, um, flipping the data, uh, fl flipping the, fa uh, the facial information, removing random pixels, blurring, for example, apply, apply, applying Gaussian blur or um, deep privacy, replacing the facial image by a generated image. Um, so we call them either simple noise-based approaches, coarsening-based approaches, because you're removing information instead of the art, um, which are those that um, at the moment claim that they can effectively anonymize the data. Keep in mind that usually we also talk about utility. In, uh, in some of these cases, if you share face, facial images on Facebook, for example, there may be some utility retained here, for example, maybe here or there maybe even here, but here, of course, you have no utility retained because the image of the face is replaced by the image of the face of somebody else. Um, okay, and then what we did is we said, okay, so um, like seeing that all of these um, uh, papers claim that um, there, these anonymizations were effective, um, let's see if we can re-identify the users. That was really easy, so then we thought, okay, let's see if we can train a machine learning model that can invert this anonymization. So that, of course, would be perfect, right? Because then we would reconstruct the input um, from the anonymized image. So for that um, purpose, what we did is we essentially um, trained um, uh, um, uh, neural network, um, a conv convolutional neural network with an additional um, uh, linear layer in the middle. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about what I should tell you, um, but I'll, I'll be very brief. So essentially what we do is we take input data um, 
an input that is anonymized, we pipe it through such kind of a neural network model and we try to um, reconstruct the original image um, that has been used for anonymization before the data was anonymized. And I'm just going to skip to the <clears throat> to the results because they are um, comparatively decent. Um, okay. So we use the Celeb A database, um, 70,000 images for training, 275 um, by individuals, by 30 images we used for the evaluation. Um, and then for the permutation, essentially the output of the permutation looks like this. Um, so we can perfectly reconstruct the permutation. <coughs> this is not very surprising because it just destroys utility, but all of the information is still there. Remove pixels, we can um, reconstruct perfectly. Gaussian blur, we cannot reconstruct perfectly, but um, the uh, the output looks comparatively decent. Um, and pixelation, well, I mean, if the information is lost, then we can still reconstruct some kind of a, a face that looks like a face, but um, where information is lost, of course, we cannot um, perfectly reconstruct it. Um, suffice to say that um, we always see um, the uh, accuracy in identification tasks. We trained we trained um, face identification algorithms. Um, so here we see the, uh, the accuracy of the face identification before anonymization. And here, well, here we see it after anonymization. And here we see it after our D anonymization. Um, so the first case, um, identification works perfectly. Re-identification works perfectly. When somebody removes the pixels, um, identification after re, um, sorry, the identification of the person after using our re-identification or um, inversion algorithm works perfectly. In the case of Gaussian blur, identification after our inversion algorithm works perfectly. Um, here, in the case of pixelation, it doesn't because um, the information is already, um, there's so much information that is removed <coughs> that um, re-identification simply doesn't work. Um, this is also not surprising because there's so little information left in the image that, that of course, um, you cannot re-identify anybody. Also, a, a human would not be able to have any utility in this data, right? And then if we, for example, take masking eyes, re-identification is perfect um, or um, almost perfect. I'm a little bit uh, quick here now. If we take this um, uh, latest state of the art algorithm, um, re-identification goes up to 70%. Um, so not quite perfect, but still the, the claim that this was effective anonymization is broken. And only in the case that you replace the facial image really by uh, somebody else, well, then we can reconstruct uh, reconstruct the structural similarity score, but we cannot re-identify, of course, because I mean, the person has been replaced. Um, it's also, again, if you upload a photo like this to Facebook, there's no utility for the users because of course, essentially this person was replaced by another person uh, and hence there's no utility for the users. Okay, I'm running out of time. Um, so uh, if you have interest in, in uh, any of these um, things, uh, do let me know, I'm just, I'm going to skip quickly um, to the summary here. Um, so we, when you look at our study, we realize that behavior or biometric data is very high, uh, has, uh, is of very high dimensionality. Um, it's um, usually collected as time series or sequential observation. Um, the entropy is extremely high. Um, that means that even tiny habits or pecu peculiarities of individuals are immediately captured. Um, the same holds for typical patterns um, or certain um, uh, peculiarities due to medical conditions. Um, so simple anonymization, some, something like crossing, aggregation, um, any kinds of um, uh, simple anonymization like these will not uh, work um, in practice. Um, so the only chance to not lose privacy to Meta, Google, Smart City Dresden, or whoever you, um, it is to act like everybody else or to look like everybody else, otherwise you're doomed. Um, but no, of course, so... Um, uh, in principle, the, um, the state of the situation is at the moment that we're working hard on uh, developing new me uh, mechanisms and techniques to, um, uh, to help anonymize also behavioral and biometric data. Um, and uh, we, I think we're on a good way. So um, uh, at, some, at some stage, to some extent, we hope that we can uh, provide you with drivers of your wearable devices that you can um, happily use metaverse and whatever. Um, without being tracked or without um, having your medical conditions or your politi political preferences inferred. That brings me to the end. Um, <clears throat> I only have five minutes, we only have five minutes left, left officially. My apologies for that, but if you have questions, um, shoot me now. Uh, if you also, if you're interested in uh, details of the other studies, um, I can quickly look at those slides.
Um, but I wanted to give you the chance to, to ask a few questions um, after all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Do we have any questions from the audience in the meantime? Uh, thank you for the great uh, class. So I really enjoyed it. So I have a one general question. So, so as you might know, this community is mostly about embedded system where we only have limited resource uh, generally. So what we usually discuss in this, this community is like, um, maybe we in favor of, you know, less use resource usage. So we talk about simplification for example we um somehow obtain sensor data less frequently sometimes if you have enough time to complete this task we do it slowly and sometimes we do it approximately so we don't care about this 100 percent you know correctness or accuracy whatever you call it so that kind of simplification i don't know how to say but that kind of simplification and approximations are going on in this yeah. community so then my question would be, what would be the implication of these activities in privacy? Yeah, Actually, that's two a, different that's things. A so at the yeah. same time, firstly, maybe we export less data, like if we sense less frequently, and we expose somehow process data. In that sense, maybe I myself believe that it'd be not bad for privacy, but at the same time, the volume of the data is somehow digested so we expose somehow representative data maybe it's not a good idea i mean for privacy so these two different things are in my mind at the same time so can you comment on that sure so uh, so i was mentioning earlier that uh, that there are different ways of anonymizing data and um, i was talking about coarsening um, but uh, the the more general terms are that we can anonymize data either by generalization, so that means uh, removing details um, or uh, remove, uh, reducing the resolution of the data essentially, and the other way of anonymization is perturbation, so that it essentially means adding some kind of noise. Um, now, uh, when you're saying that, um, you for example, you're reducing the frequency by which you're um, collecting information, that is generalization for us, that is generalization because essentially instead of having for example information every millisecond you have information for example every minute or something right so you coarsen the the resolution of the data um, as i was mentioning earlier um, coarsening or generalization um, is not effective for um, for anonymizing uh, behavioral data so this this will not suffice to um, to achieve privacy of the users in this case um, it may so happen that for example um, let, let me distinguish two things here. Um, I was talking about um, the risk of identity disclosure and the risk of attribute disclosure. Um, for the risk of identity disclosure, um, it will not suffice. So um, we will be able to re-identify users also in course and data. For the risk of attribute disclosure, in some, in some senses, um, this may um, suffice. So for example, if you take somebody who has a tremor, if you reduce the um, granularity of the data sufficiently, you will not be able to de detect that the person has tremor. Um, so, so this is a very simple example, right? Um, so for some of the attribute disclosure risks, um, generalization may suffice, but for identity disclosure risks, it will not suffice. When you say that you're also using approximation, um, if approximation essentially means that you're having like some kind of interpolation between um, uh, different um, uh, samples, let's say, um, then again, this would be something like generalization because it does not um, effectively perturb the data. However, if you would use some kind of um, approximation where you where you add some noise to the data, um, then this could actually suffice also to um, I, uh, to prevent um, the risk of identity disclosure. Um, this is going to be comparatively difficult because a lot of the noise, of course, can be removed again by, for example, simple Kalman filters or something, right? So if this is the case, then then again you will not um, prevent identification of users um, but if you apply some kind of noise um, in your approximation um, that um, that is more sense or that um, that is a little bit more sophisticated than just like noise um, like uh, adding gaussian noise on each of the samples then this could suffice also to uh, to um, uh, remove the identity um, information from the data 
Great. Thank you. Makes sense. Thank you. By the way, we're we're not working with embedded, so we are also working with embedded systems, but we don't use um, we don't make do uh, active research on on the embedding of the systems essentially. Um, but um, but when we think about uh, location tra trajectories um, or or also the movement, the behavior, the gate behavior, um, we also collect um, the data from embedded systems essentially, and um, and. Um, at the moment, we are, we are heavily in, invest, uh, invested in, in trying to um, to uh, find effective anonymization methods for such kind of data. Um, so if you're interested, um, at the moment, we are modeling uh, the entire, for example, if, you, if we think about gates, I didn't show you the examples here, but if you think about the way that people walk, what we're trying to do is now that from two or three gate cycles, we're trying to train the, um, uh, the entirety of um, of the generating process. So you walking is the generating process, and we're trying to train the pecu peculiarities of, of your way of walking, then to be able to remove this um, identifying information from future samples of you. Um, same holds for GPS locations. Um, so we're working um, with a company that, that actually has um, GPS uh, information from mobile phones, and they want to be able to effectively anonymize the GPS locations of the users. So now we're trying to learn, um, we're, we're trying to train models of the generating process, this being people going from certain places to other places, and then effectively adding perturbations on this information, on this generating process, because that would actually then effectively anonymize the data. And uh, I mean, if, if you're interested, if you have any kind of similar information, if you're interested, um, I'm sure we can have a chat and, uh, and it could be quite cool to see um, how easily, how quickly we can identify people and, and then also how we can model the underlying process and then how to how to anonymize the data collected from this process. Good. Thanks a lot. Any other last questions? If not, Thorsten, thanks a lot once again for the great talk. I think I really enjoyed it very much. And we can touch base again once you're interested and ask more, have more discussions about this. Yeah, if anybody wants to connect, um, there's only two Thorsten Strufe in the world. So if you Google my name, you will find me. Send me an email, I'll be happy to talk. Thank you. And I think you know that we are recording the entire video, so we'll upload it on the YouTube of our ESC Week website. And yeah. uh, uh, hopefully, then you can get even more coverage and maybe more questions from the audience coming afterwards. I'll be yeah. happy. Well, uh, <laughs> one at a time, but that's going to be cool. No, thanks a lot. And enjoy the rest of your week. Yeah, thanks. See you. Bye bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, Akash. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye-bye. Have a nice day. You too.